My name is Daryl Kwao. Uh, we begin tonight from Parliament where Finance Minister Ken Oforiata uh, delivered the 2018 budget. He says government through prudent management of the economy has reduced the country's debt to GDP ratio significantly to 68.6% 60, by the end of 2017. According to the minister, this is the first time since 2006 Ghana has witnessed a year-on-year -year reduction in the debt to GDP ratio. Ghana has consistently been recording mountain debt to GDP since 2016. The finance minister was presenting the 2018 budget in parliament. Our government, through prudent management of the economy, reduction in the fiscal deficit, and a policy of debt reprofiling, has successfully reduced Ghana's debt burden. The debt to GDP ratio has declined from 73% at end December 2016 to 68.3%. That's at the end of September 2017. This is the first time. Mr. Speaker. This is the first time since 2006 that Ghana has witnessed a year-on-year -year reduction in the debt-to-GDP ratio. The interest burden of Ghana's debt has also been reduced. Interest payments have reduced from 45% of tax revenue to 43.8% in September 2017 with a 41.9% reduction at the end of 2017. Mr. Speaker, it's important to note that the annual average rate of debt accumulation of 36% over the last four years has declined over the last nine months from 36 average rate increase to 13.6%. This, Mr. Speaker, again, is the lowest annual public debt <laughs> over the last decade. Meanwhile, the finance minister, Ken Ofriata, says government has turned the economy around, ending the year with a fiscal deficit of 6.3%. Now, presenting the budget's uh, statement in parliament, Ken Ofriata noted this is the second time in a decade, this achievement is happening. This year's budget has been Christine putting Ghana back on track. I'm happy to note that we have turned the economy around. <laughs> and our policies are yielding results. Restoring hope bringing relief to Ghanaians. Personally, it is heartwarming when a parent runs up to you. Thank you. Thank you for putting money in my purse. Because she did not have to pay 2,000 CDs for her two daughters in a system. Excited teacher trainee shows you the, the text message notification of his allowance received. Yet these are just two examples, Mr. Speaker, of the promises some said were impossible to fulfill. Mr. Speaker, we resolve to be fiscally disciplined and respect the limits this August House set for us within appropriations. Again, I'm glad to report that we are well on course to end the year with a fiscal deficit of 6.3% from 9.4%. In fact, lower than the 6.5% contained in the budget in March. If I may add, Mr. Speaker, this is only the second time in a decade that a government has managed to stay within its budget deficit target. Well, the finance minister there touting government's achievement in this year. Let's look ahead to the future and what government is projecting. It has set 
an overall gross domestic product GDP growth rate target of 6.8% for the 2018 fiscal year. The finance minister says government is projecting to achieve a non-oil GDP growth rate of 5.4% with an end period inflation rate of 8.9%. The economy is also expected to have an average inflation rate of 9.8%, a fiscal deficit of 4.5%, uh, GDP, and a primary balance surplus of 1.6% of GDP. Let's hear more from the finance minister. The following macroeconomic targets are set for the 2018 fiscal year. Overall GDP growth rate of 6.8%, non-oil GDP growth rate of 5.4%, end period inflation rate of 8.9%, 8 .9%, fiscal deficit of 3.8%, not, not fiscal deficit of 4.5%. Primary surplus of 1.6% of GDP and gross foreign assets to cover at least three and a half months of imports of goods and services. Fiscal sector 20, oh, 2018. Mr. Speaker, moving into 2018, our fiscal program is firmly anchored on the ongoing fiscal consultation. Our prime focus is to ensure that the fiscal deficit which remains our principal fiscal anchor is programmed to decline to 4.5% of GDP from the projected 2017 end year estimate of 6.3%. Well, so let's do some reactions now. What are people saying about the budget? Well, we spoke to uh, some personalities who were in Parliament to watch the finance minister deliver the budget. Um, this is more of a fantasy budget, a budget that doesn't appear pragmatic in any way at all. If we start by looking at the theme of the earlier budget, sowing uh, seeds for jobs, as we had in early 2017. If we look at the ASEMPA, so-called ASEMPA budget for, that was a mid-year mid review budget. As against what we have today, you could see clearly that there is no correlation in the themes for this budget. I was expecting to hear from the minister responsible for finance what the projection is going to be regarding debt to GDP. Obviously, I was, he made reference to debt to GDP as at June and as at September. But that is not enough. I've come through the entire document. I've not seen where he's projecting the debt to GDP is going to be. I find it very unfortunate, and I think they should have. I say this because I'm sure the state is very much concerned about what the debt to GDP is going to be by the end of the year. And that is why they decided not to give the information to us as we speak. But I can say on authority that by end year December 2017, the debt to GDP will be in the range of 73.36%. I say this because if you look at what, where we are going, we cannot end the year with 68% if you are not fail to analyze it. All I can say is that um, we based our figures on credible data, and the IMF is also aware of all the figures that we've churned out today. So one, as for the data credibility, I mean, it's... No 419 data being put on the budget. It's nothing like producing false data, I mean, to prepare a needs budget. No, this is the actual data on the ground. And I just want to correct something that um, the former deputy minister said to concerning the paperless um, one. And let me tell you that any time we have to increase taxes, we bring it to the floor of parliament for parliament to approve. We haven't increased taxes. Rather, we have, um, we have increased compliance through the paperless um, system. Inherited growth rate of 3.6 and year 2016, which has been the lowest in almost two decades. And in and, and year 2017, it is projected that growth is going to end at 6.3%, almost double what we inherited. Policy rate hovered around 25.5%, which has been reduced, drastically declined to 21%. That is good news for businesses. You see, the inflation has dropped from 14.1% to 11.6%. Deficit has been reduced from whooping 9.4% to 6.3%. This is brilliant. 
Well, let's get some expert analysis on government's projection for next year. Uh, my colleague, Georgia Fay, has been speaking with economist Professor Peter Quarte, who is optimistic about the targets set out by government in the 2018 budget. Here, when this budget was read, some of us raised the point that all these tax incentives would work depending on the response from the private sector. Once private sector responds, uh, then you would have uh, them producing more, generating more revenue, paying more taxes. Uh, but at the moment, the response has not been very significant, and that, that is one of the reasons why there's been some revenue shortfall. But I believe going forward, government will learn its lessons and, and, and try to um, uh, you know, streamline its activities. Talking about learning lessons, let's look at even the, the revenue approach, the measures that they are outlined in raising revenue as well. Uh, do you think that they have learned their lessons, having uh, seen the economy now for almost uh, eight months or even nine months? Well, I believe so. You see, some of these incentives, tax incentives, um, they are partial. There are other factors that will work to uh, enable the private sector kick in at the cost of doing business. So electricity tariffs, um, infrastructure roads, and, and many others. So at the moment, we've seen tax reduction. We've seen some attempts to provide infrastructure, some attempts to provide all the enabling environment. So I believe we'll see more of the results in 2018, but 2017 is a bit premature to see significant improvements. Um, but having said that, I, I, I want to quickly go back to the growth numbers. Um, you, you realize the, the target of 7.9, it, it looks decent, but if you take out oil, uh, you find that it's about 4%. That tells you clearly that we have not diversified our economy, we have not done much in terms of transforming agriculture and manufacturing. Those are the key areas that will generate the jobs. Well, uh, the finance minister talked about several things in relation to young people, talked about youth unemployment and creating 100,000 jobs, also talked about uh, tax holidays for entrepreneurs below uh, 35 years. Now, my colleague Sheila Tamaklo was at the University of Ghana campus to pick the thoughts of uh, some students after the budget presentation. Right now I'm here and there's a board behind me. Like I said, I asked them, describe the budgets in one word. And we have things like industrious, um, better, optimistic, actionable, sustainable, political, and all. And I'm also here with them. So we're going to find out from them what their thoughts are about this particular budget. Okay, so hi. Yeah, for you, did the budgets meet your expectations? Yes, the budget did meet my expectations. Cons um, considering all the promises that Nana Kufuado uh, made during his campaign, this budget seeks to, seems to be a decisive budget. He seems to be on course to achieving all his campaign promises. But my only problem is that they seem to be sidelining the opposition in this budget. I would have wanted a more inclusive um, approach to the budget. Yes. All right. Um, also, for my friend here, um, there was the bit about um, job creation, about 1,000 um, national service persons to be employed in the agri sector. What do you make about this particular initiative? Yes, so I think it's a very good initiative that government is taking because naturally, as a graduate, you are not really enthused when it comes about agri. So to be employed in that sector, I'm sure the government is going to put in measures to make sure they incentivize these graduates to make it very, very good uh, for them to be able to enter into that center. Last year we experienced doom so as he probably said there and then if we are going to reduce the tariff, even the energy bond that they were going to issue also failed for instance. So if you are going to reduce the tariff, the, the revenue that they are going to get is also going to reduce to some point. Then you have to also finance that one into it. So I think it's too early for us to issue, structure the electricity well and then be able to get a constant flow of electricity then so that we can solve that so that the other business can also flourish alongside. I'm coming to you guys, but I see you shaking your yes, head. Yes, I, I tend to disagree with my brother. The energy bond didn't fail. It's the highest bond energy bond in Africa. So we didn't well, feel. it failed in terms that I think he didn't meet their targets. Okay. So of course, every, it happens with every other bond. You cannot oversubscribe the bond. But and no, 
So that doesn't mean that the government cannot make a bold step in cutting down. It is it's part of the broader agenda of the government to grow the industry. They are saying that people who, who are in the industry suffered from the doom so challenges. So this is a sort of a relief for them. So I think it's a good sign in as much as our energy bond you are seeing in the field. Yeah. I want to agree to an extent with Bright because if we are recovering from a situation that was not so good. It has to really take time. It has to be procedural. It has to be gradual. So just reducing the tariffs, like you were saying, reducing the revenue that will be generated out of that, I think is not so good at this point in time. But if other measures, so now I would cite with KK, if other measures can be put in place and make sure that this is not going to affect the government in the long term, I think it's fine. It's good. Now, let me come to you. Do you think that the budget really had the youth in mind? Did, did, did anything they say in there, do you think it touched you right as a student? Okay, thank you very much for this question. I believe I said the budget itself is ambitious, so it factored so many things into consideration. And one thing that caught my attention was, one, the reduction on the tax holidays for students or people that are aged between zero, let me say, and 35 years. I think that's a, very, a step in the right direction. It's going to stimulate uh, entrepreneurship from the point of the youth. Uh, aside that so looking at the 100,000 uh, jobs that will be created come next year. I believe that one to open more job, like more jobs for the graduates that are coming. So that's it for me here. You've heard from our future leaders, like I said, and it seems the employment bit is quite attractive for most of them. Reporting for Joy Business, my name is Sheila Tamaklu. Well, from the University of Ghana campus, we're taking you now to the Garden City in the Ashanti region, where some uh, business operators have also been reacting to the budget. Uh, this budget for me was well articulated, well delivered. Um, on the whole, if you look at the statistics that were given uh, in terms of macroeconomics, and when I say macroeconomics, I'm talking about inflation, exchange rates, uh, GDP, and interest rates. You look at all these things and you see that, yes, so far it's going well. So for me, it's a budget of hope, it's a budget of. Uh, a challenge and I believe we can do it we can all right so l let's speak to Joseph Fakosi um, first and foremost your impressions oh in fact uh, I'm, I'm being impressed with the reduction of the electricity tariff and the reason being that it will go a long way to reduce cost of production of industries we know that uh, electricity tariff forms part of the cost elements of the industries and once there's a reduction it's going to help them to improve on their profitability and this will help them to even expand and thereby create jobs for the unemployed use in Ghana here. And the consumers are also going to enjoy similar reduction. And this means that their disposable income will improve for that matter. I mean, they can make savings and our banks will can also mobilize more. And also they'll be able to increase demand of certain goods and services thereby growing the economy. You know, because when you talk about GDP, it's about output as people continue to buy and the companies increase their production, then the GDP growth will increase. So that's good. Okay, um, I have an entrepreneur here, uh, Mr. Franklin Nyako. Um, what were your impressions about this? Yes, um, first of all, um, the reduction in, le in electricity tariffs is very key. And also the tax incentive for young entrepreneurs is also very, very key. Um, because um, if you look at it, if um, give young entrepreneurs the opportunity to enter into certain businesses and also give them tax holidays. I mean, it's, it's not seen before because what I know is that tax holidays are normally given to big corporate organizations, certain mining companies and things. But to give um, young entrepreneurs tax holidays and even to carry their uh, negatives for five years, that is, I think, that is compelling. And I think that if it's going to be done, that, is, that would be very good. I'm so those were some views from the Ashanti region. Just in case you missed out on the presentation, here are some highlights of the 2018 budget.
All right, so it's time to bring you the Joy Biz Business Van. We want to talk about the online real estate marketplace, Mikasa, which is one of the fastest growing startups in the country. It was started by three uh, friends, and the platform is providing solutions to the cumbersome task of seeking property to rent or purchase. Your story on the Joy Business Van. In 2013, three friends founded online real estate marketplace, Mikasa. Kelvin Yame met his co-founders Rashad Saini and Kofi Amwesi at the Meltwater Entrepreneur School of Technology in Accra. So we worked on different ideas. There were ideas that we could have actually built into business, but, but for reasons like the market, for reasons like skill set, if I look at my co-founders and myself, you know, is this something that we can actually take and, and build successfully? And again, for obvious reasons like funding because some of the ideas needed more money mm. you know than others so we had to brainstorm um, and we came up with a real estate uh, problem uh, which is how do we connect people how do we make it easy for people to find accommodation having been stressed out himself searching for an apartment kelvin understood too well how difficult a task it can be Mikasa.com was built with a $90,000 seed investment from the Meltwater Entrepreneurial School of Technology, helping to connect property seekers to property owners. I will honestly say that I was very confident. So we were looking to how do we approach from all angles the FAQs, these questions that they would ask, you know, it's a Ghanaian business, you know, what's, what's the, the, the trust that you can deliver? Why should I work with you? Why shouldn't I list for free? You know, why sh what's the guarantee that you won't go behind me and close the lead, you know? And then, again, for a startup, the risk is how long before you, you collapse and you have wasted our time, right? So there were all these uh, interesting questions that they were asking. Um, but I think one key thing that worked was relationship. For the kind of business they are in, Kelvin and his team knew they had to build the trust of clients, and that is why relationship is so important to them. Well, that appears to have worked for them. We have more content than any vertical in Ghana. We generate more leads. So in terms of people who are actually contacting our customers and looking to rent or looking to go and view the property and make a close, we generate over 11,000 currently, you know, than anybody. And so, and in terms of page views as well, we do close to 500,000 page views. So people are browsing and viewing, you know, pages, property details page, engaging with our content on our website. In 2015, Mikasa got a major boost after securing $500,000 investment from Frontier Digital Ventures, a global VC firm headquartered in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, consolidating its position as a market leader in Ghana. We started monetizing um, early um, January um, by having different products for different customers because every customer in their, their new developers have separate needs agents. Again, they have different hierarchy. You know, just, there are people who have office spaces very, very established. They have employees and they go after maybe the high end or they go after apartment condos and there are people who just do low-end properties. Mm -hmm. There are people who are selling. We have clients who are selling properties in Dubai, you know, elsewhere. In 2016, Kelvin was named among Forbes 30 on the 30 list of promising entrepreneurs in Africa, and recently his team acquired Jumia House. To attain the level of success Mikasa has, Kelvin recognizes is about getting the right team. I mean, I think it's tremendous uh, from where we started you know we started from a really i didn't mention we started from a really small office like it was a kitchen at the time messed you know it was a small kitchen no ac no fun but it wasn't ideal we were just there in, in a short time for like two months i, I think uh -huh. and the reason was we were waiting for our space in the mm. link to be ready but um what i noticed at that period i mean none of my co-founders complain you know and that's when you know that you have the right people who are ready to, 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 to work with you who are ready to, to sacrifice. So first success, I, I think it's my co-founders. I met the right people. It's really, really key because you, you need people who will be in for the long term. You need people who will be really honest with you. You need people who would want to overwork regardless of how much money is coming in, who want to you know take up other tasks. So I think that, and who trust the CEO, who trust whoever the leader is. I mean, 
that with acquisition, I, I think it's, it's giving us more opportunity to serve our customers more. It's giving us more opportunities to, to deliver, you know, the promises that we, we continue to, to give our customers in terms of traffic, in terms of leads, in terms of return on investment. We want to, I mean, we want people to feel that their business is growing. You know, we want to give them an alternative to, to marketing because the, the, the traditional market is very expensive, it's not very targeted. You know, there are all of these disadvantages why they, they can't pick that option. So we, we want them to see this option as a very resourceful option, a very reliable option, you know, to, to, to help their business grow. And we want our consumers who, regardless, will continue to invest because real estate is like a very basic need, right? We need it's a lot of deficit. We need more people to be incentivized to build more. But when they build more, we, we need people to acquire this or, or to, 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 to occupy these spaces, right? So we want people who are looking, you know, we want to make it very easy. You don't need to have a lot of money and hassle to own. And pretty much the passion of the team behind Mikasa to ensure everyone owns a property. And I want to quickly bring you our interview of the day. Well, the Association of Ghana Industries is engaging captains of industry in the manufacturing sector on ways to reposition themselves to benefit from government's industrialization agenda. Speaking to Joy Business at the AGI Industrial Summit and Exhibition, newly elected president of the uh, AGI, Dr. Yao Edu Jinfi, said the uh, association is setting out a new agenda to fit government's uh, plans. Interview of the day. Government is looking at AGI at being the vocal point or the private sector to actually champion this one district, one factory. Looking at the 216 districts in Ghana, we AGI are going to do our own research to find out what are the natural resources in each district. And therefore, looking at the applications that are coming from our company members in all the districts, that we'll be able to advocate or streamline and present these companies to the government to see how they can help in terms of. So it is not really about who you know private sector would have to reposition themselves to reap the gains from government's industrialization agenda. Speaking of repositioning, what best steps do you think private sector would have to take or prioritize to reap the benefits of government's industrial agenda? When you see the 10 point um, policy that the government is putting together so far as industrial transformation is concerned. Of course that means that we the private sector must be positioning ourselves in terms of changing our thinking that it's like the government has something that they want to give it. Interview of the day. That's it for our program tonight. There's more news on our website myjoyonline.com forward slash business.